Hi, I'm Dana Stevens. I'm Slate's movie critic, and um, I'm sitting here unnaturally in front of a camera, ready to talk to um, to Chris Orr. Hi, Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Orr. I'm the uh, the online film critic for the New Republic, uh, and I'm also looking at a camera and wishing I could see Dana. But uh, let's get going. So we've gathered here for bloggingheads.tv to talk about the current state of uh, what we're calling loosely Iraq war movies, but but actually it's a much larger category than that. You might think of them as post-9-11 movies. Um, there have been a lot of them coming out this fall for the Oscar race and, and other reasons, and we want to talk about why all these movies are coming out now, why they're clumped together, why many of them or most of them I think are fairly disappointing, and just sort of what they're doing out there in the national consciousness. So, Chris, you were telling me an interesting theory last night about uh, the three waves. This was, this was your um, idea that the, the post-9-11 movies have come in three separate chunks. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, I'd, I'd be glad to. It's a, it's a theory. Whether or not it's interesting, people have to decide for themselves. Um, I feel like there's been sort of a, it's been three waves, as you said. The first was uh, two years ago, basically. In 2005, you had this, this string of sort of highbrow, uh, conspiracy movies that were not about Iraq or the war on terrorism, but but captured this mood of uh, whatever a government that you couldn't trust, powerful forces beyond us. Uh, there was Syriana, Good Night and Good Luck, The Constant Gardener, The Interpreter, Munich, uh, and I really don't think we'd seen uh, such a run of of highbrow conspiracy movies since the the mid 70s, uh, when of course we were in a similar situation. We did the, the Vietnam War had just ended. There had been Watergate. There was the same sense of an immensely unpopular war. And, uh, and, and a mistrusted government. And you, back in the 70s, you got the Parallax View and the Conversation and Three Days of the Condor and, of course, all the President's Men. Um, and it seemed to me that was sort of the first wave. And then the second wave, which was mostly last year, a little bit this year, uh, was the, the sort of literal 9-11 movies, the ones that were fairly non-political. They were, they were played pretty straight. There was World Trade Center, there was United 93, and there was um, A Mighty Heart. Uh, so it seemed like the first way we had the politics, but not, but not the war. None of those movies mentioned Iraq, and I think Syriana, which obviously was the most 9/11 of the of the bunch. I think it I think it might have mentioned 9/11 obliquely once or twice, but but none of them were. Sort it took of, place in an almost, as I recall, Syriana took place in an almost completely fictionalized Middle East. I mean, nothing was named and, and nothing was quite nailed down, and everything worked via some sort of parallel with with the current day rather than, than any literal names even of countries. Isn't that, that right? Uh, I, think, I think that they mentioned some, some countries, although you may be right, but there was certainly no mention of the Iraq war. Um, anyway, but as I was saying, the, the first time around you got the politics and not the war. The second time around you got the, the, the war and not the politics. And then this current phase, which there have been sort of three movies already, which we'll talk about, and there are a couple more yet to come this fall, uh, is the movies that are, that are political movies about the war. Um, and obviously Hollywood being Hollywood, they're, they're all pretty, pretty sternly anti-war. Um, and I agree with you that in general I, I found them rather disappointing. Um, but it's, again, it's a little bit similar, I think, to the 70s, where, where your first wave of conspiracy movies, um, although inspired to some degree by, by Vietnam and Watergate, um, were not about Vietnam, and it wasn't until the late 70s that you got Coming Home and Apocalypse Now and uh, The Deer Hunter and all the movies that were literally about Vietnam. Um, yeah, what I like about the, the about this uh, this theory of yours, I mean, the way that we have you know um, politics without the war, then the war without politics, and now these clumsy attempts that are coming out to bring the two together is that I mean, it almost reminds me of sort of like a, a psychoanalytic process or something because I feel like the most successful movies about the war were the ones that were not about the war, you know, and that as these issues start to get worked through, so to speak, and you know, to come into into sort of literal consciousness of the of the movie maker, they get less and less interesting. And yeah, it, it becomes more I think of a kind exactly of a, right. a dull reenactment. Well, why is that? Um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, the, the one I think I mentioned to you briefly, I think in some ways the most successful sort of war on terrorism-themed movie of the last few months uh, was The Bourne Ultimatum, which, of course, was not about uh, the war on terrorism, was, was not about real life in any way. It was an escapist fantasy, but had this sort of political undercurrent. Uh, and I think on some level, because it wasn't trying to be overtly political, it actually worked pretty well. And, and you had that sort of, it had that, that useful political resonance, but it didn't feel like it was lecturing you constantly. And, and the, the more explicit movies that, that we're going to talk about, I think, have all had a sort of whatever clumsy lecturing quality to them. So, okay, let's get, let's get to the current, the current clumsy crop. And, you know, I don't mean to lump them all together, because there's a lot of distinctions in what they're trying to do and, and how well they do it. But now we've got... In the Valley of Ella, the new Paul Haggis movie that's opened, which is, I guess, more about um, you know PTSD and war veterans than about the war itself, but with flashbacks to the war. 
uh, rendition, which is opening today, about the extraordinary rendition and, you know, the use of torture in other countries. Um, what are our other current ones? Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? What are our other current ones we're talking about? Uh, oh, we have the, uh, Ella the, rendition. The kingdom? The kingdom. Oh, the kingdom. Yeah. yeah the okay, kingdom. let's start with the kingdom, since that was the first of those three to open, I believe. Um, so, so the kingdom, just briefly, if those of you out there haven't seen it, is, um, is sort of, again, obliquely about the war in the sense that it's about this fictional bombing in Saudi Arabia. Um, and the idea is that, you know, two terrorist bombs explode in Saudi Arabia and a special CIA unit is dis- dispatched over there to try to, to find the origin of these bombs. And, I mean, I would, I would argue, I think you may agree with me, Chris, that the whole thing kind of devolves into a sort of red meat, ass-kicking, you know, let's get the towel heads scenario, um, but with a very, very strange and muddled political message. Yeah, um, yeah. Do yeah, you want I to talk about that a little I, bit? I, I mean, the message I kind of gets like tacked it. on crazily at the end in, in a way that, that really seemed, seemed quite strange to me. I didn't understand the politics of that movie at all. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think I didn't dislike it quite as much as you did, um, but it definitely had this feeling for me that it was a, it was a very sort of jingoistic screenplay. You have these, these heroic, patriotic FBI agents who want to go back to Saudi Arabia to, to avenge uh, the, the people who were killed in these terrorist attacks. Um, and you have the Weasley State Department guys who talk about diplomacy and the, the, the way that the FBI guys actually get to Saudi Arabia is by blackmailing a Saudi prince and essentially going over there illegally. Um, and, uh, and uh, I mean, all you really need to know about it is, uh, is Jeremy Piven plays the, uh, the State Department's man in Saudi Arabia, which I think gives you a pretty good sense of right. how it feels That's about the State Department. That's pretty much the view of the, of the um, government, the U.S. government. So it's definitely this, like, this, Gold runs this sort of whatever gung-ho, let's go kick some butt feel to it. Right. Um, although I thought director uh, Peter Berg, who, uh, who was who used to be an actor, still does some acting. Um, I thought he did a pretty good job. I mean, he'd said in some interviews here and there that he was nervous about making a jingoistic movie, and he clearly tried not to. I mean, the the screenplay by itself, I mean, really almost looks more like it would be a, you know, a Vin Diesel uh, vehicle or something like that. Um, and he tried to direct it with with real nuance. It was this sort of strange match of 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 uh, of content and, and form. Um, and I thought for most of its run, it, wor- it worked out okay. I mean, I mean, it definitely, I didn't think it was a great movie. It was a little bit complicated because it was trying to be an action movie and trying to be a political movie. And, you know, l- somewhere in the process, they decided that they might be they might be able to get an Oscar out of it. So they were trying to be a little high-toned. It, it was an awkward mix for me. I, di- I didn't think it was quite as bad as, as I think you did, but you, you really disliked it, right? Yeah, I really could not get with that movie. I just thought it was so phony and so uninvolving. If I hadn't known that Peter Berg directed it, I don't think I would have even been able to try to like it as much as, as I did. And I, I don't know, he tried to do that whole Paul Greengrass thing of the, the handheld camera and the very shaky, you know, the disorienting, jolting feeling. And to me, I don't know, I just felt like it was it was selling out on every front. It was trying to be the Vin Diesel action movie, and then it had this very pious and strange last line that we'll talk about. And, you know, tried to throw in Jen Garner doing her 24 thing and a really embarrassing scene of her taking um, revenge on this, this group of terrorists who's been responsible for the death of one of her colleagues and, you know, sort of becoming like the ass-kicking Jen Garner girl, um, whatever her hero is on, on, on um, her, her one used to be on Alias, I can't remember. But um, I don't know. I just walked out feeling really depressed about the war and about movies about the war and everything. But sure. let's talk about the last line of that movie. You, well, well you first let me just say, I, I totally, uh, agree, with, yesterday I totally agree with you about the whole handhold camera thing. I cannot wait until that fad is over. I feel like it... it there are some people who can do the handheld camera. I think Paul Greengrass can still get away with it in the Bourne movies, but God, I'm sick of that yeah, guilty... Com- since, what, 15 years or something? Since uh, since Homicide, that's sort of been the way of telegraphing tension in a movie. You've got to yeah, jiggle your camera It's supposed to make, make things yeah. more realistic. No, I, I completely agree. Really, really annoying. Um, and I also agree about Jennifer Garner. I mean, I think that the silliest element of the entire movie is if, if the United States were going to send an FBI team to Saudi Arabia to investigate a bombing, the idea that they would include a woman, let alone a woman who spends most of the film in a tank top, is just is just ridiculous. Right, and not only that, but her character is the forensic examiner, and they all seem very surprised in this scene where these devout Muslims are upset that you know a, a, a young, attractive woman is handling the dead bodies of their you know of their men, and you think that there might be a little. Well, maybe the State Department does function on that little research, but there doesn't seem to be any sense of you know the other culture at all. Oh, and then a sad thing. I don't have his name in front of me now, but the uh, the actor who plays the Saudi cop, the sort of good Saudi cop, who's terrific. He's, it, uh, he's an fantastic. Israeli actor whose name I do you I, remember his name? Escapes me too. 
I don't. I don't know, I thought he was. A, I thought he was from an Arab country. I, I just remember that he's the, one of the guys. He's one of the two principal actors from Paradise Now, which is a really wonderful movie about terrorism and one that was really that really sadly sank like a stone when it came out a couple of years ago. And I don't know. It was. It was just sad for me to see that guy's body sort of borrowed. You know, as. Um, I don't know. As although, the, although he was very good, the, in the one movie. good Arab in in the kingdom. Uh, although he was very good in the movie, I'm pretty sure he's an Israeli actor. It's certainly possible I'm I'm wrong, um, and it annoys me that I can't remember his name. But uh, but he, I thought he was he was extremely good. Uh, oh, in he the is kingdom. really good. Um, and I thought he's Chris, really good. I just felt that he was being he was sort of being used. Look, here's the one good. I mean, the movie was really really full of. I can't remember if I can't remember what uh, what they all were, but the movie was really full of kind of you know. Um, scary epithets about, about Middle Easterners, the towel head and the like. And right. again, it, there was no sense, there, you know, one minute there would sort of be a sense that we were judging the characters for, you know, having these, these very biased beliefs about Middle Easterners. But the next minute we were cheering them on as they blew away roomfuls of terrorists. So I came out feeling kind of queasy about that. Whole no, thing. I, I completely agree. It was a, it was a very confused um, movie. I, uh, Again, I, I liked it more than you, but I, I, don't, I don't think it really. Let's succeeded. do the last line. Let's just talk about the last line of, of the kingdom, and then, and then we'll, we'll get on to our other movies. So, yes. so the, the one other thing I just want to say is, I thought, in addition to the actor we talked about, I thought Chris Cooper was was fabulous in the movie. I thought he was really great and took a very small role and made it really good. And then I'm a big, uh, big Jason Bateman fan from uh, Arrested Development. He brought a little. Uh, little comic. Yeah, he was it. funny. He was you didn't good. know what the hell Jason Bateman was doing in there, but he's always a welcome exactly. presence on screen. It was sort of odd when he became the bait all of a sudden. There's a big scene where Jason Bateman is, is kidnapped and and you know suddenly becomes this this uh, this kidnapping victim. Oh no, you're just so used to having Jason Bateman be the clown that it was sort of strange to see him with a knife to his throat. You know, what will, you know, what will George Michael do if he's killed? Um, <laughs> exactly. I still can't separate him from Arrested Development, but that's another whole sad story. Yes. Um, so the last line of the movie is this is this strange attempt. I mean, now, should we, should we say what of, should we say what the actual line is, or should we? Yeah, 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 we, yeah. yeah it's, okay. it's spoken by two different people, we'll right? Spoil it. Yes. Um, so, so we find out essentially. Let's see how much plot summary do we need to do? Ah, I'm not going to do any. So, so Jamie Fox, the leader of the CIA secret unit, um, whispers something in a, a key moment in the movie into Jennifer Garner's ear, and it's something that helps her go on, that helps her recuperate from the death of his colleague and go and blow Arabs away, and. Um, and we find out at the end of the movie, after some build-up and suspense, what this thing is that he whispered in her ear. And it turns out that, that those words are the exact same words that are the last words of this, this terrorist, sort of Osama-like figure who's assassinated in the course of the movie. And the, the words are... whispering them to his grand, granddaughter, is it? His daughter or I granddaughter? Think so. It's his last words. It's the terrorist's last words, too. And he's, yeah, he's saying them to this young, this little girl who's yeah. in the room who we presume to be daughter, his granddaughter. Daughter and the words are, don't worry... He says, don't worry, dear, we'll kill them all, right? And that's essentially what Jamie Foxx says to Jennifer Garner, too. It's all right, we're, we're going to kill them all. Yeah, so you have this right? movie that, that again, uh, is this sort of jingoistic setup and, the, you know, the brave FBI agents going over and kicking terrorist ass, and then it ends on this note of just complete moral equivalence that just bears no relation to anything else in the movie. It's like it totally pulls the rug out from under the, under the film. But it's um, not, isn't it ironic moral equivalence? I honestly don't know at that point whether... I mean, obviously, I, I didn't, I didn't it can't be a good ironic. liberal I mean, Hollywood movie if we're supposed to feel good about both sides wanting to blow one another away, right? That's some kind of observation about the futility of war. Please tell me. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't take it as ironic. I thought it was earnest, and I thought it was the kind of thing that, that people put in a movie when they think they've got a shot at an Oscar. And, and the movie had originally been slated to be released, I think, in the spring, and they put it off to the fall because they'd gotten all this good buzz, and they sort of they clearly were, were hoping to get some, some Oscar recognition. I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty hard, to, hard to imagine that they will. Um, but it just, that just seemed like such a sort of play for for sophistication and relevance and to be more than just an action movie. Uh, and, and my feeling is that, you know, there's a big difference between sophistication and schizophrenia. And this was the latter. This was a movie that, that you know, for the first three quarters of it, was, was it was the war movie that, that war supporters could really get behind. Uh, you know, it's about the war on terrorism, not, not Iraq. But but, uh, but it was definitely a movie for, for Hawks to enjoy. And then at the end, it has this just way out of left field moral equivalence line that just made not an iota of sense to me. Um, very, very peculiar, and really, I thought, pulled the rug out from under the movie. Yeah, I wonder if somebody who just enjoyed the movie, unlike me, how they would process that last line. I mean, would they walk out sort of saying, dude, it got really deep at the end? I mean, I don't know what the, um, you know, the action movie fan enjoying the movie would do with that ending either. But okay, so I'm going to consult my notes for a second, and I'm going to move on to our next movie. Okay, well, let's okay. talk about Valley of Ella, which I think actually... You liked more than I did again, or no? Or did I like it more than you did? I think, I think you may have liked it a little more than I did, although I don't think the, the difference is an enormous one. 
Um, I mean, I mean my, very different kind of movie than, than The Kingdom, obviously. It's a much more serious and some would say self-serious drama about returning veterans, um, which I sort of I sort of went into with a queasy feeling because I didn't like Crash at all, the, you know, the, the big Paul Haggis Oscar winner of, of two years ago, and found it very ham-handed. And even though this movie might be accused of, I guess, some ham-handedness, it's sort of a miracle of nuance compared to something like The Kingdom. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm one of the few intelligent people I know who actually liked crash um but but i still had a bad feeling going into in the valley of ella like you um the story it's basically a story about a uh a, an, an older man uh played by tommy lee jones a former mp who was in in the army uh, for the vietnam war uh whose son is also in the army and whose son comes back from iraq uh and the movie essentially begins with with tommy lee jones getting a phone call saying that his son has gone awol he's gotten back from iraq but he's left the base uh nobody knows where he is uh, and Tommy Lee Jones eventually goes to the base to f- try to find his son and find out what happened to his son. Um, and uh, it's a it's a it's a very well made film. I mean, the performances are terrific. Tommy Lee Jones is 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 remarkably good in a in a relatively understated role for him, I think. Uh, and the cinematography is good, and the the writing is pre- is pretty solid. But and, and and for the first whatever half or two thirds, I was reasonably reasonably into the movie but by the end it, it does just come to this just thuddingly one note uh political cl- conclusion which i just thought was was you could see it coming but it was still just utterly depressing yeah it was also a little bit i, I don't know a little bit of a, a cynical attempt to turn to turn a real tragedy i mean this is based on a you know an actual murder of a young soldier by other returned soldiers that happened a few summers ago into a thriller, a suspense thriller. I mean, some of the moments when Tommy Lee Jones and um, Charlie Theron are, are on the trail of the killers and there's a little bit of a gumshoe procedural mm-hmm. feeling felt like a little bit um, formulaic to me. I just couldn't help but be really moved by by Tommy Lee Jones' performance in that movie and, you know, and just by, I don't know, the films that he sees of his son coming back. You know, he has these um, uh, little clips of video that he watches in, in a very, I admit, very corny and formulaic way that's a little bit too conveniently paced for the plot where he finds out, you know, from these little home movies, bit by bit, horrible things that his own son did in, you know, over in Iraq. Um, right. They've been taken on his on his son's camera phone but damaged by the heat, and so he has a friend who's trying to repair the files, and he basically gets one little video file repaired per day that he can look at. So at the same time that he's trying to find out what happened here in the United States after his son got back, He's, he's learning about what his son's experience in, in, uh, in Iraq was like and, and the, the horrors he saw and, and participated right. in. And we at the, in, the, in the audience are learning it at exactly the same pace, which is right. the, the slightly too convenient part. But aside from, okay, I mean, we could disagree about the, the quality of the Valley of Ella, but what, what function do you think it performs? I mean, you know, now that we've talked about a few of these, of these war movies, I don't know, I, just, I start to have this larger question, what are these movies for? You know, I mean, yeah. what are they trying to accomplish, not just as works of art or works of entertainment or, or win Oscars or whatever it is, but... You know, what are we supposed to get out of a recreation of an atrocity of, well, of atrocities that I mean, are actually happening in the real world? What I mean, what I found frustrating about in the Valley of Ella is I think its its subject is a valuable one and one that really hasn't gotten that much discussion, uh, which is the question of we're going to have a whole lot of returning veterans who have had a terrible time in Iraq, uh, and I mean, whatever. Obviously, we saw this after Vietnam. There are a lot of people who have trouble reintegrating into society. There are a lot of people who are injured. There are a lot of people who've, who've suffered just psychic trauma of one kind or another, and there's been very little discussion of this. And I think it's a really worthy subject uh, and a worthy subject for a film. What, what drove me nuts about the movie was it essentially made the case that every single soldier who comes back will be completely damaged and hollowed out and will have participated in atrocities in Iraq and will now be, you know, this empty shell of a human being, uh, you know, who's either either ready to be a killer or ready to be killed. Uh, but, but it even adds, you know, it has that little subplot around the side with somebody who's not even in the movie, but, but the, Charlize Theron plays a, plays a cop who helps Tommy Lee Jones, and there are a couple of mentions of... Uh, there's some woman who comes in to try to get help for her husband, who's a, who's a veteran and who, who uh, drowned the family dog in the bathtub, and the police can't help, and later in the movie you discover that he's now drowned his wife in the bathtub. And it's just, it was so utterly relentless. I mean, uh, obviously there will be people coming back from Iraq who have had terrible, terrible experiences and are really, really hurting, hurting from it, but just the idea that every single one will have been turned into a monster, I found just... So amazingly, yeah, that's a little bit. You said it better than I. But what I was, what I was trying to get at a little bit with this, with this um, question of how the whole thing became a police procedural. I mean, there's there's a fine line between 
you know, wringing one's hands over the horrors of PTSD and returning vets, and then asserting that everyone who comes back is a psycho killer. But you haven't seen Brian De Palma's Redacted yet, right? No, I have not. I have not seen it. I mean, if I were fighting in Iraq right now, and I saw Valley of Ella, I might, you know, take some things a little amiss, but also identify, and, you know, probably be very moved. If I were fighting in Iraq right now, and I happened to see Brian De Palma's Redacted, I would be furious, absolutely (laughs) furious. I mean, Redacted takes, it's it's a sort of faux documentary. I'm not even going to get into summarizing it now, but it's a repulsive movie, and it takes that logic of well, know, it's about, PTSD, it's, it's uh, about, returning veteran, equals psycho killer, sort of to its ultimate De Palmian extreme. So it becomes like Iraq as a slasher movie, and I just found it really distasteful. Yeah, I, I have not seen it, but that does not surprise me in the least. When I first heard that, that Brian De Palma was making an Iraq movie, and it was about, it's about U.S. servicemen who, who rape and murder an Iraqi girl, is that right? Right, again, based um, on a true story. Uh, but again, it's just it, how perfect of Brian De Palma. He, he's trying to make a high-toned political movie, and he still can't help but make it about violent sex. I mean, it's just, he's such a stunning hack, and uh, I think one of the better developments of the last uh, you know, decade or, or so, maybe, maybe even two, uh, is that people, I think, have come to realize that Brian De Palma is not a great American filmmaker, which for a while a lot of people thought, which I just find astonishing. I mean, he's made some good movies, but I think overall he's a, he's a major hack. Yeah, that is really annoying. Uh, the quality of his, down, of, his, of his output has definitely gone downhill, too, but he was never in any high rank of American filmmakers, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, the one comfort I take from Redacted is I think it will really sink like a stone. It's a very weird... It's just it's, it's a very cheap Brian De Palma movie, for one thing, because I think he couldn't get funding to make it, sure. so it looks kind of crappy. I don't know. I, I can't imagine that many people are going to get into the theaters and see this movie, or that it would have much of a following if they did. But I am sort of... I'll be, I'll be interested to see the... Um, the response when it does come out in a couple of weeks. Sure. The, the uh, one, okay, well, the one actually, other thing I just want to say should... about in the, the Valley of yeah. Ella that, that frustrates me so much is obviously Paul Haggis opposes the war. I, I do too, although I supported it uh, initially, which uh, I feel exceptionally stupid about. Um, but uh, what, what frustrated me is I felt like he was doing basically the same thing that a lot of people on the far right at places like the Weekly Standard do or, or Hugh Hewitt, which is he was basically appropriating the troops for his political message. He was using them as sort of as sort of dummies. He was saying, well, you have to you have to oppose the war if you support the troops, in the same way that, that Bill Crystal or somebody like that says, well, you have to support the war to, to support the troops. And, you know, the fact of the matter is there are plenty of troops over in Iraq who are really gung-ho and who think that they can accomplish their mission and who, whatever, are, you know, are on some level pro-war. And there are plenty of troops in Iraq who are miserable and desperately want to come home and think the whole thing is an enormous fiasco. And I suspect there are a lot who think, you know, one or the other on alternating days, but but it's immensely frustrating for me to see this whole class of people, and people who are, you know, doing a, 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 her, a heroic and horrible task for us, just sort of appropriated as mannequins for, for people's political biases. I mean, Bill Crystal does not support the war because he supports the troops, and I don't think that, that Paul Haggis opposes the war because he supports the troops. Uh, and in both cases, I just found it extremely annoying that they would just essentially appropriate the troops for their for their their political purposes which which really don't have a whole lot to do with the troops uh, at all I think anyway. you're right you're right I mean that could become a whole different and very interesting conversation about the phrase support the troops and what that's come to mean in the exactly. I don't know it's been used since the first Gulf War, war at this point but there's almost not a, a non-cynical usage of that exhortation anymore but, and, and I'm be... sure that what Paul Haggis thought was well everybody says you know support the troops and they mean support the war and and I think that the counter argument is if you support the troops you'll want to bring them home um, I just think he made that counter argument in such a heavy handed and ham fisted way uh, and and while he was trying to be pro troop i mean if you're if you 're basically saying that every single soldier who served in Iraq is going to come back as a hollowed out monster that 's not a terribly pro troop message even if you intend it to be um, right anyway uh, what's the there 's one more uh, oh yeah, I was just saying, we we should have actually started with the most recent one um, <laughs> because this today. is the one that people are probably sure. tuning in saying, "Should I go see this movie or not it 's opening today it's it 's a it 's rendition. Um, the new, who is the director of this movie? Although I can't remember. Our, our today is Friday, and I don't know if this is going to run on run today yeah, or right. Monday or whenever. You're right. But but relatively new movie. But, wait, but who is it who made rendition? I can't remember now. Uh, oh, it's Gavin Hood. Gavin, That's right, the Gavin director Hood of Saucy. Done, so South, South, South African director. Right. 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 So, so rendition, um, Reese Witherspoon, Jake Gyllenhaal, Meryl Streep, giant star-studded cast. This is maybe the biggest of the Oscar-seeking post-9-11 movies that's opening. And... Um, Pretty leaden and clomping, I would say. Do you agree on that? Uh, I, I do. I thought, it's again, it's frustrating because if the, the, it's a movie about, about extraordinary rendition and, and at its core about, about torture and about the, the Bush administration's embrace of 
torture as a, as a method in the war on terror. Uh, and you would really think if, if there were any subject, any political subject that, that Hollywood could make a good, uh, good movie out of, it would be this. I mean, it's, I think, a relatively straightforward discussion. You believe that torture is legitimate or, or you don't. I, I don't. I think it's an atrocity. Uh, and, and whatever, and it's a cinematic one on some level. Uh, and yet the movie, I just think, is, is a structural disaster. It has all kinds of major flaws that result in it being really static uh, and and just dull. Um, did you want to did you want to talk a little bit? I, I know you were you had particular thoughts about about Reese Witherspoon in the movie. About Reese Witherspoon? Well, I mean, it has it has more to do with you know not her performance per se. She doesn't have very much to do except sit around and worry about her missing spouse. I mean, the basic story is that Reese Witherspoon is the wife of an Egyptian national, but American citizen. You know, someone who's been in America for most of his life, who's detained at an airport for because of a mix up and essentially, you know, exported to an unnamed foreign country and tortured for information that he doesn't have. So Reese Witherspoon, sort of unwittingly, because there's there's nobody else to be the star and the protagonist becomes the star of the movie, has absolutely nothing to do but sit around wringing her hands. And she does a fine job at, at her hand-wringing, but I guess my question was, why does... Why does torture have to happen to the husband of Reese Witherspoon in order for us to care about it? I mean, there's just a Hollywoodization of of the, the question of extraordinary rendition, torture, interrogative methods, and so forth, that stacked the deck so thoroughly that there was no real room to think about anything. I mean, I, it, yeah, I com- say I you're decrying agree. the abuses at Guantanamo. You're not doing it because every single person there is, you know, an architect or whatever the guy is, a chemical engineer in suburban Chicago who's married to Reese Witherspoon. You know, it's not because who's, who's married, they have some wonderful an, life that they're coming home to. Who's married to an eight-plus-month pregnant Reese Witherspoon toddling around. Right. Oh, that's uh, right. That, well, that's the ultimate deck stacking importance, exactly. is that she's they, pregnant. And actually, in, 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 in the light of a mighty heart just recently having come out as well, it sort of seemed that... You know, the, the new black is sitting around, in, you know, pregnant, waiting for your husband to be returned from, you know, his, his Middle Eastern kidnapping. I mean, it was it's, it's sort of the Angelina Jolie, Reese Witherspoon axis, not to actually cast versions on either one as actresses. They're both sure. fine in their roles. But but, you know, it's this it's this uh, the sense that the ultimate victim is sort of, you know, the beautiful Hollywood actors. I mean, I would have liked to see a movie about some real lowlifes getting extradited and tortured. You know, or, you know, someone who questionably does maybe have a relationship to terrorism, or if not, is at the very least, you know, somebody that we have a hard time identifying with. And then we have to actually work to think about, you know, what is this person's, um, you know, what, what rights do they have, what rights do they not have? I, I, what is the United States' um, obligation toward a non-national, non-citizen there are all kinds of gray areas that would have been inter- interesting to explore. Instead, this, the whole thing is just it's just divided into the, the good and the evil. Meryl Streep, too, who rarely overacts, is given little choice but to overact in this very overwritten villainous role as a CIA operative. Yes, and no, it's, this is one of those movies where if you have bad politics, it means you're a bad person, and so Meryl Streep has to you know, live in a, in a palatial mansion and, and yell at her maid who has a little black and white uniform, and, uh, and the, uh, the torturer who tortures Anwar, uh, Anwar's the name of... Uh, Reese Witherspoon's husband. The, the 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 torturer has to be abusive to his family, and there's a whole other subplot that I'll, I'll get to in a in a minute, maybe. Um, but I did want to just say that I I, uh, I completely agree with you. It, the Reese Witherspoon role is a very strange role. It almost seems like it would have been a peripheral role, like the like the wives in World Trade Center or something, where you just you know cut to them for 30 seconds to show their anguish or something, uh, and it was somehow sort of blown up into this large. Uh, this you know larger role for a for a for a big star who's I mean she's theoretically the star of the film, um yet and yet not a single thing that she does at any point in the entire movie has any meaningful consequences at all. I mean as you said she talks on the phone she goes to some meetings she doesn't actually accomplish anything. It's a really sort of thankless role. Um, and I also completely agree about about Anwar about the the, the deck stacking. He's this incredibly handsome uh, Egyptian born guy, but he's went to NYU, he's lived in the United States for 20 years, he has his green card, and there's not even, I mean, even with a character like that, you could give some hint that the CIA might have some reason to suspect him. Like, you know, this is a guy who's never, as far as we know, ever even been to a political rally. He doesn't have any radicals in his family, even back in Egypt. It's, it just seems like they could have been given some tiny hint of a reason to really think that he was a danger, apart from the, in the plot, what he, he evidently has gotten, his cell phone has been called by some terrorist on multiple occasions over the last year. Um, although one of the well, big frustrations of the movie is they never actually explain what happened. 
Right, exactly. I was going to say, just in terms of sheer plot holes, like let's treat it just as a thriller for a second, it would be nice to know why he did get those phone calls. Right. Whether it's going to cast any doubt on his character or not, that's that's something that's, that's never wrapped up and it's very dissatisfying. Well, and the that, whole and movie, as you say, has a very static, draggy feeling that just it makes it really hard to sit through. I can't imagine, in spite of you know, the stellar cast that it's going to... It might have a good opening weekend because of who's in it, but I can't imagine it's going to have many legs, this movie, because it's just would, too boring. I would depressing. be surprised. I mean, we, we, are, we talked a little bit about how the Reese Witherspoon half of the, the story is is very static and nothing really happens. The frustrating thing about the other half of the story, which is Jake Gyllenhaal is a young CIA analyst uh, who gets roped into observing the torture of Anwar, the, the, the CIA tough guy who was supposed to do it was killed in a... In a, in a suicide bombing, and so Jake Gyllenhaal, who describes himself as a pencil pusher, uh, has to be the one who observes the torture, and Anwar is beaten, and he's waterboarded, and he's electrocuted. Uh, and what I found most frustrating about it is you have these, these two competing monologues that the, the interrogators you know, say, you've been talking to this terrorist on the phone, and Anwar says, no, I don't, I've never heard of that person, I have no idea what you're talking about. But at no time do these two monologues ever intersect in a way that, that creates... A dialogue, even a even a convert, uh, even a coerced dialogue, um, it just seems utterly clear to me that the first thing that an interrogator would do at this point would be so you know is say so who was it that you talked to on April thirteenth at nine forty two in the morning for eight minutes and you know Anwar would think about it and he'd say oh that was my you know my uncle back in Egypt or something and then that would give the CIA something to do they could investigate and see you know is he telling the truth is he lying but instead you just get a repetition again and again and again of this. You're right. the only thing that changes from scene to scene is what they whack him with after asking him the same question no exactly right? you're you're you know you've talked to a terrorist no i haven't punch you've talked to a terrorist no i haven't you know, gurgle. You've talked to a terrorist. No, I haven't. Zap. I mean, but it's the same scene played over and over again. And Jake Gyllenhaal has, not, has nothing to do but sort of sit there looking morose. And then in the scenes that take place outside of the, the uh, interrogation sessions, he, he's turning into a drunk. But, but like... You're right. So it's, the second, so it's the second subplot in a movie with many subplots in which somebody sits around completely passive. Reese Witherspoon and then, and then Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, it's... I have a completely off-topic question for you about Jake Gyllenhaal. Do you like his performance in this movie? I mean, I... I sort of did. It strangely appealed to me in some way and it reminded me of a throwback to some... He seemed like a 50s star, like the kind of role that Jimmy Stewart might have played or something like that. 40s or 50s. And and then I started, after I had written my review, I started to read some other uh, critical response to the movie. And lots of people hated his performance. So I'm just huh. very curious what you thought of it. You know, there was so little to his performance that, that I, you know, I, I, it didn't really grab me. I certainly didn't think he was bad. Uh, and I, and I, I was intrigued by his face a little bit. I think that he's... He's sort of coming into his face in an interesting way. Uh, you know, he used to be, he used to have a very soft face, you know, back when he was doing Donnie Darko and so forth. And as he's gotten older, I mean, not surprisingly, his, his you know, his jawline's gotten a little firmer. So I feel like in this movie he has an interesting face in that, in that it, he's got a sort of, you know, hard jawline and, and harder face, but, but still has those very soft eyes and that soft mouth. Um, so I thought, you know, whatever, I, given, given the opportunity he had to, to do anything with a role like this, where, again, a lot of it is just him sitting around not even saying anything, just looking sort of glum. I thought he did a, a pretty good job, but, but, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, when yeah, I mean, at least, at least unlike Reese's role, he had a little bit of moral complexity. You know, at yeah. least you, I guess maybe people are fascinated a little bit to talk about his performance precisely because he was so trapped. He was just sitting there inert the whole time, but he's supposed to register all this, you know, moral dismay on his face. And, I mean, I, I thought it was an interestingly stylized performance. Somehow I just I just kept imagining him in, in black and white in some old movie about the French yeah. Resistance or something, and I, I, I could picture him in that <laughs> French movie. Resistance, that would have been good, yeah. He has that look somehow. Um, there's also, the, so you I, want to talk I feel like we should mention, there's a, there's, a, there's a third subplot, which is about the, the torturer himself. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing it's supposed to be Egypt. They keep referring to it as, as North Africa. They never actually say what country it is, which is It was filmed in Marrakesh, North. those scenes, but they, they deliberately don't name the country. Yeah, which I found vaguely off-putting. It's a, if you're sort of portraying yourself as a sophisticated film about, you know, about a real-life political issue, it seems a little odd to me to not be willing to say what country Yeah, all these movies place. are politically wimpy in terms of not wanting to actually say, say where they're taking place. Or if they do, like The Kingdom, they take place in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. which is probably the safest place in the Middle East that an American could be. So, sure. I mean, the, the whole thing, is just, it sort of seems like a, a strange attempt to not, not offend any embassies or something. But go uh, on. A, anyways, this, this uh, torture, there's a whole subplot about his daughter... Is uh, is seeing a boy that he doesn't approve of, and she's essentially left home and is hiding out with their with her aunt. Uh, and there's a long subplot about her and this this boy she's seeing, who is gradually revealed to be something of a radical. 
Uh, and the weirdest thing I thought about the film is this starts out as a sort of small subplot, like the Madrasa subplot in Syriana, and you don't really think it's going to get much screen time. But, but over the course of the movie, I feel like it, it starts to swallow the whole movie. And you have, you know, you have these, these two other subplots. You know, there's one in, in Washington, which has not only Reese Witherspoon and Meryl Streep, but also Peter Sarsgaard and Alan Arkin, all these big stars. You have this other subplot with Jake Gyllenhaal uh, at the de- detention center. And then you have this third subplot uh, about the torturer and his family with no-name stars, uh, you know, uh, nobody that, that most, most American viewers will ever be familiar with, uh, that basically takes over the whole movie. And at the end of the movie, when there's a, a great tragedy. Uh, it actually takes place in this subplot and not in the sort of main plot about about torture and rendition. And it just seemed a very, very odd an, a very odd construction. By the end of the movie, it doesn't actually feel like it's about uh, Anwar who's been who's been uh, tortured or, or Jake Gyllenhaal or, or uh, uh, Reese Witherspoon or any of those characters. It feels like the, the movie's really about what had seemed a subsidiary plot uh, at the beginning and a plot basically about, I think it's point would basically be that, that sort of violence begets violence, which is all well and good, but is really has a, a limited amount to do with the, the subjects that are supposedly the, the, the titular subjects of the film. I mean, it, it winds up in the end, I think, not really being a movie about rendition, um, but a movie just about how, whatever, it's bad to be mean to people and torture them. And <laughs> It's bad to be mean to people. Yeah, that's pretty much the takeaway. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought it possible, but you're right. That That is actually, that subplot about the sort of Romeo and Juliet romance between the terrorist in training and the daughter of the policeman is the most boring of all the very boring plots in the movie. But, I, have to, I realize the now one, that the only the scenes I look forward happens. to were the ones with... Excuse me? But it is, it is the one where something actually happens. Um, it's just the characters aren't very compelling. So you have these, whatever, yeah, you have these two subplots it's so, that it's have... It's so plottingly arrived at. It's just so plottingly arrived at that by the, time, that by the time you get there, you actually see the act of violence twice, once at the beginning and once at the end. And at least me, by the end, I was just, I was thoroughly disenchanted and, and could have cared less. I think the only scenes I really look forward to and in rendition were the ones where Peter Sarsgaard appeared, because I just always love Peter Sarsgaard, and he managed to do a lot with a small role as this kind he's of great. He's bureaucratic the, yeah. senator's aide. Yeah, really he's, good. he's a f- Reese Witherspoon's friend who's a high-ranking staffer for a, a senator and tries to help her find out what's happened to Anwar. And, and, and I agree, I think the best scene in the movie is a scene between him and Alan Arkin, who plays his boss, the, the senator, which I thought was, was a great scene and really crackled, um, but was very peripheral to the to the rest of the movie, and, and we didn't really see any other scenes like it. it it's really the only scene where, where Alan Arkin got to do anything at all. Um, right. Anyway, it did just seem to me like one of these movies, I think occasionally people put together movies with, with sort of, you know, two or more alternative subplots and weave them together and think that they'll somehow enrich one another. Uh, and I think they just they just totally trip over each other. I think that, that the whole rendition story, both both at the detention center in North Africa and back in Washington, would be much better without the, the whole torturer subplot. I mean, among other things, you'd have the time... Uh, to, to whatever, to make something of it, to, to give it some kind of dramatic uh, motion forward. Uh, and I think the whole story about the, you know, the torturer and his daughter and his daughter's boyfriend would probably be better if it were its own movie as well. It, it just struck me there, I don't know, that uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors is a, a movie that always comes to my mind, and a, a lot of people like it better than me. But it's a movie that it just seems to me that, that the Woody Allen and Mia Farrow storyline would be a good storyline, uh, and the, uh, and the, uh, the Martin Landau story would, would also make a good movie, but I didn't feel like they enriched each other. I felt like they just basically got in each other's way, and this was a similar I movie. don't remember it well Much. enough, although I did I did love Crimes and Misdemeanors when it came out. I remember. I mean, I was thinking of rendition as being more influenced by the whole Crash, Babel, you know. Um, I mean, I don't think that Crash and Babel were necessarily influenced by one another, because sure. one had already wrapped when the other came out, but but, you know, that sort of style of multiple layered storytelling. And this was and definitely Syriana the low too. end of that style. And yeah. Syriana, right. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. It um, takes a lot of narrative skill to weave those things even semi-successfully together. I mean, I don't think that either Crash or Babel did it perfectly. But, you know, you really see the downside of that kind of filmmaking when you, when you see something like Rendition that's just sort of a, a random clumping of various not very compelling narratives. And, and, but I think, and to be okay, clear, I think a we should much, maybe... much worse movie than Crimes and Misdemeanors. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, no comparison. Um, so, so let's maybe just, you want to wrap up by just talking about a few of the uh, upcoming? I mean, we're not done yet with the, uh, the fall 2007 spate of, of Iraq movies. What have we got? Brian De Palma's Redacted, which I think I've already spewed my opinion about. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so looking forward to it. What else is coming up? 
There's a kind of melodrama with John Cusack called Grace is Gone that I think is probably going to be, um, you know, maybe more milking the tearjerker side, but it's kind of interesting because it's the first movie that I can think of about a, a female soldier killed in Iraq, and he plays her widow, who, widower who's, um, who's mourning her back in the States. I haven't seen that yet. Have you I, I, I have not seen that. Everyone, everyone is saying it's, you know, John Cusack's big Oscar opportunity, um, and I'm certainly curious, but no, I have not, I have not seen that yet. I'm curious. I like John Cusack, but I always do think of him as a comic actor. But I'll definitely check that out. And what else have we got coming? Uh, and then there's this. This uh, I also haven't seen it, but it looks amazingly awful. Uh, this Lions for Lambs movie, Robert Redford directed it and stars in it. And it also has Meryl Streep, although I think in this film maybe she's a good guy rather than a bad guy. Uh, and its most interesting piece of stunt casting is uh, is Tom Cruise's Republican senator, uh, which which sounds uh, entertaining in a in a train wrecky kind of way. Um, but the 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 previews of the, for the film have been bad, and, and what I've heard from people who've seen it, and the, the buzz I think is, is pretty pretty bad. It looks like what's the it premise be, of the story? Do you more know? heavy-handed than the the ones we've already seen. Right. Do you know anything about what this, this story is, is about? Not exactly. I think it's about it's about a special ops mission, uh, maybe you know in Afghanistan on the Pakistan border or something like that. I I have seen a summary of the plot, but it was a while ago, and and I'm not I'm not certain. But it's another of these movies about how we. We send our, our, you know, bright, shining, wonderful young boys off to war, and they get killed or, or wounded or, or psychologically damaged. Um, I think it, it, it will not. It's not. It's not like the Valley of Ella, where it's sort of all postscript, where it's all about what happens after uh, a military action. It, 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 uh, it, it comprises a military action again. I think. I think in Afghanistan or Pakistan, but I'm not certain. Um, anyway, obviously, I, I, no, I don't. I don't know exactly what the movie's about. Um, yeah, well, that's good. That's going to be before Christmas, right? That one. Uh, that's soon. I think it's in a few weeks. Uh, yeah, maybe three weeks or so. That sounds like maybe one of the most shamelessly Oscar angling of them all. But maybe I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that till I've had a chance to see it. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe we could just. I don't know. I, I'm just thinking as we're talking here that in in the case of the Vietnam War movies, the great Vietnam War movies, they all came three or four years after the war. These are all happening. You know, we're in the midst of this quagmire, and we don't know when it's going to be over. I just wonder. But even what's even, happen even more years later, I think I think they're. Mostly 1978, 1979. I think Coming Home and The Deer Hunter maybe were 78. Really? Coming Home was that late? They I, were the late 70s, huh? I think so. I, I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure. I think those are both 78, and I think that Apocalypse Now was 79. So you definitely had this gap. And then 74 to 76 was when you got all the all the conspiracy movies, when you got The Parallax View and, and Three Days of the Condor right, and the All first the President's wave, Men. Right, and, right. Um, so again, I, I think very similar to what we're seeing here, although, although you're right that this time it's been a much compressed schedule. Um, we didn't have any Vietnam movies, obviously, uh, during the Vietnam War, or any, any major sort of Hollywood Vietnam movies during the, the Vietnam War. It took several years until several years later, and, uh, and obviously uh, the, the cycle has been really compressed uh, with the Iraq War and the, and the War on Terrorism. I wonder, do you think that's just a symptom of, of the, the press cycle being more compressed and the American metabolism sort of for, for information and entertainment running more quickly than it did in those days? Th- or do you think I it think has anything to do with the wars? It, I, think, I think part of it is the establishment... Uh, is is much, whatever is much, and, and partly because of Vietnam and because a lot of the people in the establishment, you know, had a, a formative experience during Vietnam. Um, I think that the, the the establishment and certainly the sort of Hollywood establishment is much more willing to be very critical of government and and to be critical pretty quickly. I think that 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 uh, you know that that the Iraq War did not get the benefit of the doubt uh, in the way that the Vietnam War did for nearly as long as it did. Um, from the establishment. I mean, obviously, there was there are a lot of people who opposed Vietnam from from the very beginning. But but I think for the most part, it was a sort of bottom up phenomenon. Whereas uh, I think with Iraq, uh, you know, a lot of elements of the, the sort of cultural establishment uh, uh, turned on it pretty quickly. I mean, a lot opposed it from the beginning, obviously too. Yeah, well, maybe presumably because you know there still is some enough cultural memory that the Vietnam War left an impression. You know, and so I think so. Yeah, it, definitely. At least slightly fear war more than we did in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Well, and that's, I mean, again, that's what you sort of, uh, I, at least I, as somebody who was born in 1967, so don't, don't, I don't really have any memories of Vietnam. It certainly was not a formative experience in my life. But one of the frustrating things is that you see in, in, in some of the sort of, you know, boomer cultural products is you do just feel like, like the, the old roles are just being reprised again and again, and, and, you know, and Bill Crystal and Paul Haggis are, you know, would have been fighting over the Vietnam War, Thirty odd years ago, and, and and are still fighting the same battles. You, you do have the sense um, 
particularly, you know, I live in Washington, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in political circles, that, that the old battles just continue to be fought, and it's very hard for, for people to get past some of these, you know, sort of defining boomer experiences with, a, with Vietnam or the, the civil rights movement. Yeah, I'm sure that's uh, sadly a lot closer to the truth than my, you know, optimistic imagination that we might have learned something. Some, uh, well, I, 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 fear, I fear we should wrap this up, Chris. Do you think we've been blathering too long? Uh, I'm, I'm blathering? sure most people will think so. I'm happy to, to stop if you'd like to. Uh, um, although, if you I just sort of run out of movies about, to talk about. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I've just sort of run out of movies to talk about. Do you have another one to throw at me? Uh, I mean, we could talk about other movies if you want to, but, but we certainly don't need to. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess I feel like we should we should wrap it up on this topic and maybe do another another chat sometime about other movies. Okay, that sounds good to me. Um, well, thanks. This was fun. I hope I hope we get a chance to do it again. It was really fun. I enjoyed it. I, I probably won't watch the results because I'm always too <laughs> terrified to see myself on camera. But, I, I <laughs> but it was won't. a lot of fun. Ne- ne- next time, if uh, if we do this again, I'm just going to place a, a a George Clooney dummy in front of the camera and, and talk from behind it. <laughs> Or put a torture hood on your head <laughs> you to go. be topical about it. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, Dana. Uh, I hope we do this again. Yeah, you too. Take care. Bye.